On this episode of Real Screaming Kayaks, we have New Zealand destination Coromandel, where we dive for scallops and chase the annual snapper migrations. Learn how to install a fish finder in the kayak workshop section, and there's plenty of tips and tricks to lift your game. Good first fish, and it's off! Screaming! One of New Zealand's most popular locations that attracts many thousands of visitors every year is Coromandel Peninsula. With three coastlines facing east, north and west, there is always somewhere to go no matter what the conditions. Coromandel is a water sport enthusiast paradise and is famous for its marine life like yellowtail kingfish. They always prove a worthy challenge and are extreme fun to catch from the kayak. Snapper are the most common species targeted, with good numbers available during most seasons. Endless numbers of bait fish provide food for predators like kawai and trevally, who are great fun and an awesome sport fish. Grabbing a feed of crayfish is also possible if you're into diving. And then there's the shellfish. So we're in the beautiful Coromandel and today we're heading over to the east side, namely Opedo Bay, in search of some of the beautiful scallops that this area of New Zealand has to offer. You know, Coromandel is well known for its scallops. The great place about where I'm going is the scallops are very, very shallow. So, you know, generally it makes life easier when you don't have to dive really deep for them. I mean, they can be up to 10 metres or more. But, um, you know, at this location we're going today, we're talking six, seven metres to get some really nice big scallops. You don't have to be a deep diver to do that. So, and the great thing about the kayak is it can carry all your gear out there, mark your location, allow you to load your scallops into the kayak. Plus also, you can display a dive flag, which means that other vessels are going to see you while you're in the water so from a safety perspective that's huge when we get to the beach it doesn't take us very long to quickly set up the kayak with all the gear and um, it's just a short paddle to get out there at other places in Coromandel I have to travel a bit further here you know we're talking five six hundred meters out and so nice and close to shore nice and close to the launch location but in other places we're talking at least a 2k paddle to get to those scholar areas. Scallops are quite easy to see with their distinctive shape giving them away even when buried in sand. When the water clarity is really good it's easy to see them from the surface. On a good bed where the scallops are concentrated, it's possible to get your limit with just a few dives. At this location, the scallops are spread well apart, so it's a real advantage to have a decent bottom time when free diving. On a good area, it can take you as little as 20 to 30 minutes to fill your bag with its limit. Always measure and count your scallops before placing them into the bag and be sure to comply with any local regulations regarding this shellfish. During this dive the scallops were fairly spread out and hard to find but one of the bonuses I did happen to come across was this sole. It was hiding in the sand and I pounced on it with my bare hands and grabbed it. The rewards for a few hours diving, crumb scallops and pan fried sole in butter and 
olive oil. So yesterday we went for a bit of a scully dive and beautiful scallops at Opedo Bay. Today, or this afternoon, we're heading up to the western upper parts of Coromandel Peninsula. We're basically um, planning to stay the night up there and then we're going to go for a fish in the morning on the new Predator BDL kayak. There's so many places that you can camp in Coromandel. There's dock campgrounds everywhere. So it's possible to stay at the location where you are. There's also plenty of um, options for campgrounds like Papara Holiday Park's a good one right by the water so you can basically launch from where your accommodation is. So yeah, lots of options, but the upper parts of Coromandel Peninsula, especially on the western side, are very very good for the spring snapper runs which is why we're here. The upper northern areas of Coromandel are really quite remote you know there's not a lot of houses up here apart from the odd farmer and dock house and um, a bit of farmland but it's it's very very isolated it's great it's natural and you know it's kind of uh, all the Pahuta Kawa trees are worth traveling up here just to have a look at. Some of them are over 600 to 800 years old and they've fallen over in the paddocks and they're very, very awesome um, looking trees, really gnarly and old. So coming up to this upper part of the peninsula is well worth the effort. About a 40 minute drive for me from Coromandel Town and if you're coming to visit Coromandel, you know, it's quite a way up, so it's worth spending the time and, and actually, you know, spending a couple of days up here. It's, um, it's such a fantastic area to fish, and if you get the weather predictions and forecasts right, then it can be well worth the effort. So let's see what happens. Have a bit of a camp out tonight, and we'll see what happens in the morning. Dark skies and cooling air temperatures are subdued by the warmth of the fire, so the opportunity to relax was taken before Jeff arrived. It was at the moment when sleep almost fell over me that my mind went back in time to an adventure about a year ago. With a fish like that, if you were looking for a feed, eh? But, you know. Oh, this is a better fish. Yeah, this is a much better fish. And we got Jeff over there behind us too, who's hooked up. Good fish. Oh, getting a bit of a sore arm from all these good fish that we're pulling up here. And he's just going to pop up on the surface. We're just going to bring him up nice and slowly. Yeah, he's a good fish. Another cracker fish on the Injigoos. Wicked. Awesome fish. Just stunning. That's uh, about the third double figure fish I've had today. These Inchiku lures are just outstanding. Um, yeah. So we'll, we'll hold this guy up for you. There he is. Beautiful fish. About 10 pound I suppose. Good solid 4 kilo fish. So we'll put him back nice and quickly. And I'm in again. It's another string puller. <laughs> Woo -hoo. Oh crikey. It's a good fish. He's turning me around. It's really, really taking me to the cleaners. Oh, man. This guy's got some serious grunt. Great fish. These injacoos are just so much fun. He's come up. Oh, what a ripper of a fish. Here we go. We've got the hooks out. Hold them up for you. He's a nice specimen. Look at that. Beautiful fish. And he's still full of beans. There we go. Check that guy out. What a stonker of a fish. So we'll put him back now. 
There we go. Back over the side. Let's hold him upright. He's ready to go back. This guy's full of beans. There he goes. I just dropped my lure down. We just shifted and straight into another really good fish. Here we go again. Screaming off. Possibly not as good as the last lot, but unbelievable. How many fish are out here at the moment? It's just loaded with fish. And she's coming up now. Just let it let it take its time and let it sit down at the down there until it's ready to come up. There we go. And it just blew all its air out. There we go. See the air going out? That's great. That's what you want. You want that air to release before you bring it up to the surface. And there we go. Nice fish. You know? Very, very solid snapper. Another ripper of a fish. Check that guy out. Excellent. And there we go. The intricate lure is loose now. And we can let this guy go. Just a nice eating size fish. Full of beans and off it goes. Next morning we were up early and arrived on site to enjoy a cooked breakfast before unloading the kayaks. Today's fishing would be a little bit different as we were using pedal power kayaks so we had no drift chute or any other type of anchor and would solely rely on our ability to pedal into the current. My choice of fishing technique this time round would be micro jigs. They proved to be super effective too and it wasn't long before I started getting in some decent fish after landing a few pan sized snapper. This decent snapper pulled a lot of line from my reel. However, this wasn't a problem when using these kayaks as you're able to pedal up on top of the fish more and get some line back. The fish put up a good fight lasting around five minutes. Then it was released to fight another day. The fish continued to show interest in my lure and plenty of fish were pulled up on the kayak during the next couple of hours until the tide change. Every fish put up a decent fight on this light tackle and it was such a lot of fun to be pulling them in one after the other. The micro jigs outperformed the soft baits Jeff was using considerably. However, he stayed focused and was eventually rewarded. Jeff's on to a nice fish here, he's just pulled up. He's had a bit of a tough time, old Jeff has today, but he's managed to get himself a nice fish here. One for the pan, mate. I reckon. The fishing slowed as we reached the hottest part of the day and after a few more fish it was decided to head back. We'd only been out for literally three and a half hours. Awesome day out on the water, first time out in the Predator PDL up here at the Coromandel. Ended up with a limit of snapper. There's the biggest one that turns around and come through so we'll be eating that tonight. These kayaks are absolutely awesome. We've been all the way through the rough stuff up on the corner there where all the tide was. Just sit there, just feel so comfortable in them. And uh, yeah, they're just absolutely amazing. Well, what an awesome morning. You know, we, we camped out last night and had an awesome little fire going, you know, and then launched this morning after a bit of breakfast great great thing to do you know park on the beach i've been very rewarded with some some really nice fish and a, and i put a few back too you know like this is a good about the limit of the keepable fish that i would take home great size fish to eat and you know there's certainly plenty of them i mean there's a couple of goodies there good eating size fish just exactly what i like to have so Coromandel's got it all. Spring snapper time, you know, they're, they're running through the upper parts of the peninsula.
If you have electronics like a fish finder on your kayak, then one of the most common problems that can occur is corrosion of the terminals, especially those that have power running through them. The best way to prevent this from happening is by using dielectric grease. Dielectric grease is designed for taking care of your terminals, protecting them from any harmful corrosion and is completely safe to use on all electronics. To apply the grease, get yourself an artist brush that has soft bristles as this will allow you to get into the terminal blocks properly. When applying the grease to the terminals, make sure you give a good even coating to all the terminals and joiners and do the battery also. Once you've done the initial application, all you'll need to do is check the terminals periodically to make sure they've got a nice coating of grease. So when you're working these intricus, I find the best thing quarter turn winds of the handle like this. So you get it up off the bottom, you know, 10 metres or so if we're in 30, so about a third of the way. Sometimes a half of how much you're winding it up. You can see I'm just winding slowly, so nothing's happened, so I drop back down again. And as I drop down, I'm just using my thumb to pause the lure as it sinks. And that way, it's not just going down like a flying torpedo. It's going down at a, at a rate that's, that, that those pauses are what gets those fish excited, I've got to say. And here we go again, a bit more winding. And there we go. We're in. So you can see what I'm doing there by working that Inchiku lure up off the bottom like that. It's actually causing movement in it. And that, in turn, gets the fish excited enough to chase it. And they'll come up and basically attack it and hook up. For more top fishing tips and techniques, head down to your local store and grab a copy of New Zealand Bay Fisher magazine. This time in Kayak Workshop we look at fish finder installation. The method that I'm using can be utilised with any kayak model that has the ability to externally mount the transducer within a scupper. On top of the fish finder you'll need other accessories like transducer kit, battery, battery holder, fastenings, rubber grommet, electrical terminals, heat shrink and cable ties. You will also need some tools and other essentials to do a successful installation. First establish where the fish finder is going to be positioned then prepare the area before the install. In this case it's the centre hatch which needs to be removed. Open your fish finder box and lay out its contents, checking that you have everything needed. Drill a 9.5mm hole on a flat area at a location that is close to where the fish finder is going to be mounted. This will be used later for the power cable and rubber grommet. Prepare the transducer using the kit supplied by the manufacturer, then proceed to install in the kayak. Ensure the transducer is sitting correctly and is pointing directly straight down. Refit the hatch, then prepare for storing the transducer cable. You will need to store away the excess cable, and the nice thing about this kayak is it offers a centre compartment within the centre hatch for this. Never cut or modify the transducer cable, because it has been calibrated, so any modification will affect the performance. Finish off with cable ties, as this way everything will keep nice and tidy. Next, fit the power cable by feeding the end with the bare wires in the direction of the pre-drilled 9.5mm hole. Insert the rubber grommet onto the power cable, then feed the power cable through the pre-drilled hole. Finish off by pushing the grommet all the way into the hole until the head sits nice and flush with the surface of the kayak. Now attach the fish finder mount bracket to the kayak using fastenings. This fish finder is positioned on the centre hatch and attaches to the cable compartment cover. Make any final adjustments of the cable length, then tighten cable ties and trim tag ends and in this case refit the cover with mount bracket. Double check 
all the cables are running correctly and use cable ties for any last minute adjustments. Now finish off the power cable by adding terminals, joiners and an inline fuse. Solder any wires before crimping the terminals as this will ensure a solid connection. Cover the joins with heat shrink or liquid electrical tape. I prefer to use both. Finally, we need to secure the power supply, which in our case is a battery. Suspended holders are ideal and when adjustable can allow battery height to be moved up or down. This means we can adjust the centre of gravity. With the install complete, it's time to test our work and power up our fish finder. When we gather seafood, it's important that we know how to prepare it for cooking. Shucking scallops is fairly easy if you follow a few simple steps. To extract the scallop from the shell, it's best to use a short knife like a bait knife to do the job. We start by using the knife to separate the scallop from the bottom of the shell. To do this, we need to cut the foot of the scallop. This will separate the gills and the skirt from the main foot of the scallop. Turn the top scallop shell over so it's upright, then proceed to separate the guts from the main foot. Also cut away the hard white muscle that's attached to the side of the foot. We're almost there but now it's time to separate the remaining gills from the foot of the scallop. Scrape away any remaining guts, then separate the foot from the shell. And we're left with one scallop, including the row and the foot. Welcome to our Understanding Fish Finders screenshot of the month. This one shows normal sonar view with zoom option. On the right we have the normal view and you can clearly see the fish on the fish finder there are clear separations of the target one of them is doing something different to the others on the left we have the blown up view which has been zoomed two times greater than the image on the right again you can see clear separations of the fish in this view also but it's interesting to see this fish here that's come up there's two of them actually that have come up as this jig is falling down, clearly you can see that this fish has come up from the sea floor to meet the jig on the drop. Now this is a huge advantage. It gives you a real insight to know what's happening in real time as your jig falls down, which means you can be ready to engage with the fish and hook it. The number of kayaks within my fleet is many and all of them are used for various activities. Each one is set up for specific tasks that enhance the fishing methods I enjoy using. Three models in particular would be classified as the most serious fishing platforms that I use. The first is the Old Town Predator 13, a kayak that can be set up with many options. Primarily, it's a kayak for paddling and its design allows for a massive amount of stability, comfort, and loads of space for all the equipment. With so much capacity on offer, an idea was formed that would see me mount a Minn Kota iPilot electric motor to the bow of the kayak. During future episodes, we will bring you the Predator's performance, plus cover how we integrate various equipment items like cameras, and fish finder, which all need to be shared across all three serious fishing kayaks. Special thanks to our sponsors. Old Town and Ocean Kayak are what we use to get us to the action. Hummingbird, fish finders and chart plotters give us the edge to find the fish. Shark skin protects the body against the elements. Neptune assists with the free diving and Pelage captures the seafood. Jigstar rods fight the fish, Zest jigs attract the bites, and Gamakatsu hooks nail them.